I still don't think it's a dog, drawled Rick. Not a dog at all. I rolled my eyes, rather than make the same argument I'd been making for the last week. But the wounds... You think a dog is the only thing that could take a bite out of a man? Rick interrupted. You think a man can't take a bite out of another man? Come off it, I shot back. I know what you're thinking, and I'll say it again. It wasn't old Garinger that killed those boys. It was a dog. Coyote, probably. Rick sipped his drink pensively, but I knew he wasn't done. I could hear the gears clanking in his skull. You know, he said at last, they found that tribe in Africa, that, uh, that tribe of, uh, what do you call them? Cannibals? Cannibals, I correct wearily. Yeah, cannibals, that's what they was. They'd raid neighboring tribes and bring back the fat ones for supper. Oh yeah, a man'll take a bite out of another man if he's hungry or mean enough. I gave up. There was no point in arguing with Rick. He got an idea in his head and nothing in all the world could convince him he was wrong. Instead, I just stared out the window at the stretch of darkness between the tavern and the rest of the town. The blackness was formed by a dense spur of woodland spilling off the mountain. The road home passed straight through, plunging briefly into a deep hollow and crossing a sluggish little stream before coming out on the other side. It was there, where no one but the animals and the old hermit Garinger lived, that the killings happened. The first was that Preston kid. He worked part-time at the tavern, and one night he didn't come home. They found him in the hollow, great chunks of flesh missing from his body. There was no question it was a wild animal that did it. At least, no question, as long as your name wasn't Rick. We started back for home, and as we entered the wood stretch, our debate continued. It couldn't have been old Garinger, I insisted. Garinger's lived in the hollow longer than anyone can remember, and the killings have only been going on for a week. I felt mighty proud of myself for that bit of deduction, but Rick chuckled grimly and shook his head. <laughs> I already thought of that one, he retorted. Got it all figured out. You want to know what would make a docile old man turn cannonball all of a sudden? I'll tell you. Cooner. My pace slowed. No. I decided carefully. That... that can't be. You don't think revenge is enough to turn a man? When I was eleven, I replied, my dog Floppy was hit by a truck and killed. Now, I felt all kinds of angry but I didn't go biting the driver that did he. You weren't no crazy old hermit neither, muttered Rick. We both were quiet for the next few minutes. Our boots kicked through the rotting leaves, crushing twigs and occasionally scraping against the gravel hidden beneath the autumn detritus. Rick suddenly spoke up. A ridiculous grin slapped across his face. I bet Floppy was pretty floppy after that truck got through with him. <laughs> I flashed him a baleful glare. That's not funny. Of course it is. <laughs> he shot back, and his booming laugh shook the branches over our heads. It echoed off the distant hills and worked its way back through the dense trees, a distorted shade of what it started out as. <laughs> Shh! I hissed abruptly, holding up my hand for silence. You hear that? Rick brought his laughter under control and listened. What is that? Coyote, I asserted. Rick craned his neck in the direction of the sound. It was a wild, stuttering howl, high-pitched and screaming. That ain't no coyote. The last traces of laughter vanished from his face, and his skin went pale before my very eyes. The sight gave me goosebumps. And what he said next made my neck prickle. It's... It's human. We exchanged a quick glance, and all arguments of cannibalism and not funny jokes were dropped as we ran toward the noise. Rick was already reaching for his gun. Most guys who walked that road carried one these days. As we raced, the sound began to fade, 
The howls give away to moans. The moans died away to silence. Soon the audio trail was lost completely, and we came to a panting stop. <laughs> it's gone, growled Rick. I flashed my light about the woods, trying to chase away the shadows. There was a trunk of a huge oak tree, the scraggly branches of a thorn bush, and... Wait a second. There, behind the oak tree, something moved. Rick, over there! We tried it to the spot where we had seen... What? It vanished too quickly for me to positively identify. It might have been a tail or it might have been a coat sleeve. Already my memory was distorting it. A sick groan drew my attention back to Rick. It was shining its light down at his feet. What is it? I asked. I stepped in it, Rick responded weakly, pointing at the ground in front of him. I nearly threw up when I saw it. I probably would have recognized the guy's face if I could have seen it, but it had been ripped clean off, gnawed to a bloody pulp. That was the worst of the damage, but there were great crescent-shaped gouges throughout the rest of the body as well. Who do you suppose it is? Rick asked with a tremor in his voice. I shook my head. Something in my stomach was blowing bubbles. Big bubbles that released showers of gritty mud when they popped as I looked at the boot-shaped dent where Rick had inadvertently stumbled over the corpse. You still think it's old Garringer? I asked cynically. I know it is. He raised his flashlight to reveal a winding path branching off to the depths of the hollow. It was the road to Garringer's cab. That doesn't prove anything, I snapped. No? I bet if we paid old Garringer a visit right now, he would have blood on his beard. Rick started down the path, and I tried to stop him. Whoa, 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 whoa. You're not... Of course I am, Rick interrupted. I'm going to drag that cannibal out of his sorry excuse for a house and bring him to justice. Just you wait and see. As soon as that crazy's behind bars, the killings will stop. I guarantee it. Before I could say anything, he was gone, loping down the road with his gun held ready. I couldn't let him go alone, so I chased after him. Wait, 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 wait a minute, I called. Suppose you are right. Remember when they found that Wilmot guy? Um, Anthony. Yeah, what of it? Come on, I pressed. You remember Anthony Wilmot? The guy was huge, and it wasn't baby fat. Suppose you're right, and Garringer is the one who did them all in. You're just going to lay hands on a crazy who killed a strong guy like Anthony Wilman? Bet Anthony didn't have this, though, Rick replied, brandishing his gun. Besides, you got my back, don't you? Garringer's cabin loomed out of the trees in front of us. By this point of the road, if you could even call it that anymore, had become so overgrown it was a wonder the old hermit could get his old rusty pickup in and out for groceries. Rick went right up to the door and banged the handle of his gun on the woodwork. Open up, Garringer. Me and a friend would like a word with you. Hey, I hissed, tugging on Rick's arm as he waited for an answer. Look at this. I pointed at the weathered boards beneath our feet. A line of dark spots, brown in the glow from our flashlights, that across the porch and ended at the door. Convinced yet? Snarled Rick. The old crazy couldn't even bother to clean up his trail. That's what cannibalism will do to you. Turn your brain inside out. There'd been no sound from inside the house, so Rick knocked again. Harder. You got five seconds to open this door, Garringer, or I'll knock it down. I still couldn't believe, even as I stared at the morbid stains by my feet. Did Cooner's death really make the old man snap? Was he chewing up the townsfolk out of revenge? I shivered as pinpricks danced up my arms. I'd been one of the men who showed up that afternoon, accompanied by a band of others from town. Cooner's gotta go, the leader of our little hunting party said when Garringer met us on the porch. Little Ruthie's in the hospital. Might have rabies. Garringer protested, but we were firm. 
Two of us held him back while a few more went inside to fetch the dog. It was a nasty creature, mostly skin and bones, but with a savage bundle of muscle in all the right places, so you know it could mess you up bad if you weren't careful. How anyone could love a pet like that was beyond me. It was Ruthie's father who pulled the trigger and ended Cooner's life. Old Garinger was distraught, but we all agreed it was for the best. Couldn't have a monster like that running loose, not with children around. That's it. I warned him. Rick's resigned sigh broke me from my reverie. He took a step back and planted one boot against the door. It held fast at first, but a few more kicks splintered the rustic lock. All righty, Garinger, we know. Rick stumbled to a halt, and I nearly ran into him. It was pitch black in Garinger's one-room cabin, but our flashlights picked out the continuing trail of blood and followed it across the cluttered floor. Clothes, furniture, cookware. It seemed the old hermit's house was hit by a whirlwind. The blood trail meandered through the mess and terminated next to a dirty mattress. The blankets were tousled and knotted around in irregular shape. We both stood motionless for a second as we processed the scene. Then Rick stepped forward, much of the confidence gone from his stride. He reached out and pulled back the sheets. Well, I admitted nervously, he... he does have blood in his beard and even some meat in his mouth, agreed Rick, his face turning green. But I think it's his own... He dropped the corner of the blanket, blessedly hiding what was left of the old man's face. We should get out of here, I recommended. Get back to town and report the bodies. Rick nodded and turned gratefully away from the hermit's corpse. Together we made our way to the door, and as our flashlight beam swept across the opening, something black sped across the porch. (gasps) What was that? gasped Rick, seizing my arm in a painful grip. Animal, I breathed. Ain't no animal I ever saw. Didn't make no noise when it ran by. The words were barely out of his mouth when a hollow thumping tore through the air. A mad racing rhythm punctuated by the harsh tick of something hard scratching against the wood. I knew that sound instantly. Floppy used to make it when he'd go tearing along the hardwood floors of my parents' house. Let's go. I urged once the noise was gone. Rick was close behind me. We cast our lights back and forth as we reached the door, searching the porch for any sign of what we had just seen or heard. But there was nothing. I tried to keep my pace even as we made our way back to the road, but Rick kept kicking my heels, and before I knew it, we were running. The woods were full of sounds. The ruckus of our hurried footfalls, the wind in the leaves overhead, the cracking and breaking of twigs behind and to either side. (laughs) I still don't think it was a dog, Rick wheezed. My frustration with Rick's stubbornness boiled over, and I shouted back at him. Well, (laughs) what do you think it was, then? A chipmunk? I shot him an angry look over my shoulder, and in that moment, I failed to see tree root rising from the road. Shit! I went down hard and my face buried in a stinking pile of damp leaves, and Rick followed suit, stumbling over me with a cry of surprise. My flashlight went rolling off into the forest, throwing its golden beam wildly through the foliage before coming to rest about five feet away. Rick kept hold of his, and I found myself staring directly into its blinding glare. Oh, get that thing out of my face! I groaned, shoving his arm aside so I could see. You shouldn't have been following me so close. Rick's expression froze the words on my tongue. His cheeks were covered in mud from a spill, and his eyes bugged out of his head like golf balls. He wasn't looking at me, but rather something behind me. Before I could react, he held his gun out, and I rolled out of the way just before he pulled the trigger. Watch it! I screamed although I could barely hear my own voice from the explosion rattling around inside my head. Rick leapt to his feet, his weapon still held out in front of him, and I turned to see what he was aiming at. Nothing. Are you crazy? 
I screamed, punching him in the arm as hard as I could. You almost blew my head off. Rick's hand was shaking violently, and I noticed his chin was quivering. It was right there, he whimpered. I saw it. I saw it. Saw what? I demanded. But instead of answering, he began spinning around, pointing his gun every which way as though responding to noises I couldn't hear. Run, he snarled. Don't look back, just run. He gave me a rough shove and I obeyed. Rick's mind was crumbling, and I didn't want to be caught in the dark woods when it gave way completely, and he started scattering bullets. The trees began to thin out, and the moon worked its way through the canopy to illuminate our path. Ahead, I could see the lights of the town growing closer. Rick's footsteps pounded to my left and a little behind, his raspy whisper chanting, Don't look back. Don't look back. Don't look back. I spun just in time to see Rick's hands vanish into the bush by the side of the road. Rick! I shouted, drawing my gun and sprinting to the place where he had disappeared. Without thinking, I thrust my hand into the underbrush and immediately withdrew it with a cry of disgust. My fingers came back warm and wet. A violent din erupted from the bushes. The leaves crashed back and forth. Something thumped heavily against the dirt, and Rick's voice rose above it all. High and shrill and unbearable. All reason left me, like a hatch fell open and dumped it all right there. I never commanded my legs to move, but they did, pumping up and down without feeling. I was there that afternoon. I joined the hunt. Mine was a face it would recognize. The freezing night air was sucked in and squeezed out of my lungs by the same machine-like force that propelled my feet. Clouds of it billowed in front of my eyes. Behind me, I could hear, surely as the drumbeat of my own heart, a heavy panting. I could hear the leaves and gravel in my way being torn up by something hard and sharp. And in the back of my mind, I felt a rising howl. At last, I burst out of the trees, and the road was paved and lined with street lamps. Still, I kept running, obedient to Rick's final mandate. Don't look back. Not until I passed the first several rows of houses did I slow and risk a backwards glance. I could see the shadow of the hollow rising spreading, scratching against the moonlit sky. For a second, I thought I saw two pricks of crimson, but those were gone so quickly, they might have only been my imagination.